absolutely delighted to introduce Jess Reed. Um, Jess is Deputy Chief Midwifery Officer for NHS England. She has over 30 years in her career of implementing organisational change and service improvement. Uh, she's a Florence Nightingale Fellow and um, she's now appointed by NHS Inc. and to deliver on the national ambition for maternity care in England. So I'm going to hand over to Jess who's going to talk about the challenges and success of implementing policy into practice and the impact of COVID-19 on NHS maternity services. Over to you Jess. Thank you, Jane. It's good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm delighted to have been invited to do this talk to, to you all today at the third annual UK Implementation Science Research Conference. And my presentation is going to be looking at the challenges and successes of implementing policy into practice, utilising examples from maternity national policy in the NHS and the impact of COVID-19. So we're going to be covering in this talk a shared purpose, the importance of having a shared purpose in order to achieve the aims that you set out to achieve. Asking the right question, something about system drivers, how we present our research, that what infrastructure do we need to deliver? Let's look at some transformational leadership that is important if we want to make sure that our ambitions and hopes and that the research that we have, we have applied can, will be applied. Some examples will be used from NHS England to demonstrate these things. And throughout the talk, I'll be referring to how the global crisis around COVID-19 has impacted. Finally, just a word about cutting edge research, which will steer our future. So what's the context for us here in England? We have 750,000 births in England per year and approximately 130 NHS maternity services delivering care to women and their families across the country. We have the highest levels of deprivation in Liverpool, Middlesbrough, Manchester and Hull, and London has the highest population of refugees, asylum seekers, migrants, second only to New York City. So that's our country and that's our population, just a little bit about both. So what are our drivers within the NHS in England to, that, that, that we can use to drive and imp implement the important elements that we hear from our researchers? So we have mandates from the government. We have the National Maternity Review, which was undertaken and published, undertaken in 2015, published in 2016, shared by Baroness Julia Cumberledge better births, improving outcomes for maternity services in England. We are in our final year of delivering on the better births ambitions. However, that year has been hijacked by COVID-19 and therefore we have had to move our um, aims and our timeframes further on, which is one of the impacts of working within this global pandemic. We have our NHS interim NHS people plan, which helps us to, to see and understand how we can get the best out of our NHS workers, the most important workforce that we have and the, and the most important resource. And then we have our NHS long term plan, which is looking ahead from taking forward from the Better Births Maternity Review into the next five years, five to ten years, what the important elements of the maternity programme are. We work with our key partners. You can see the, um, the logos there of the key partners that we work, for, work with. Importantly here, the Academic Health Science Network, of course, very important. So what is our shared purpose here, here in, in the NHS in England? So all of these things are really vitally important. 
we need our system drivers. We need to be able to to project manage what we're doing and putting into 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 place. What what's change management tools are we going to be using and improvement tools? How are we going to how are we going to create spread and adoption? And how are we going to measure? Really importantly. And also motivate and mobilize the, the, the people, our very, very important resource. And leading, leading to make sure that our women and families in England get the best care that they can. It's important to ask the right question. So what is the national maternity ambition? It's described there in the, in the box at the top. But the question has to be phrased around what the imperatives are at that time. So it's really, really important that researchers work together collaboratively with the policymakers, the implementers, the doers, the strategists, the chief midwifery teams, the, the non-clinicians, the directors of transformation. Really important that there is co-design going on to make sure the right question is asked. And how we how you present our research. So you can see on one side a very clear academic paper, which is fine and we know is what's needed in order in order to drive that research forward, to get it published where it needs to get published, etc. However, for, to, to take the next step and make it informative for the, the very people that are going to be using the research to drive change is really important. So you can see here an infographic. I've used one that we use for continuity of care, which is an example that I'm going to use later in my com my talk. But you can see the difference here, the importance of having a, a very easy to read, easy to pick up um, aspects around, around the research that can be transferable to women, their families, anyone can be drawn to understand more about that research by looking at that infographic. So the system drivers, I want to talk a little bit about how in NHS England, our, the system drivers have been used to drive the change that we've seen in the two projects that I'm going to outline. So we need levers to implement policy. We need a very clear infrastructure We've got our Department of Health mandate, we've got better births and we've got the long term plan. We've got our NHS standard contract and we have financial incentives. So it's really important, though, that we translate that into engaging with the right people, ensuring we've got the right data, that we're having the right dialogue with the people that we're going to be working with. I've already talked about the importance of co-design. It's so vitally important. We've got to win the hearts and minds of the people who are going to be implementing our studies. And the only way to do that is to go design them with those very people. Decision making. We need brave people who are going to be able to make decisions despite the odds necessarily. Be courageous in making those decisions. We need investment in order to implement and then of course measure so that we can get the impact that we really need to achieve. The infrastructure in the NHS in England, we are incredibly privileged to have the very first Chief Midwifery Officer um, for the NHS in England. Jacqueline dunkley Bent, Professor Jacqueline dunkley Bent, was appointed only a, just over a year ago, April in 2019. And she has been able to put foot together this structure. Two Deputy Chief Midwifery Officers, again England based nationally, and seven regional chief midwives that cover every single one of the regions in England vitally, vitally important infrastructure to deliver the ambitions. And this is our maternity transformation programme. Also very, very important. We have project managers within this team. We have some clinicians, we have non-clinicians, 
directors of transformation, it's it's a really important team that we have national, working nationally, led by our Maternity Transformation Programme Board, chaired by one of our chief execs from our maternity services, our, our NHS trusts in England, which is also really important to involve the people who are going to be delivering um, the change that's needed. So the planning guidance asks every year we, get, we refresh our NHS plans and we have planning guidance and it's really important on using this example to say how important it is to have influencers who are going to ensure that your the, the results of your research are going to um, going to impact on the change that we need to see and so that needs to go into your planning guidance or some similar um, national driver so that there is something that people have to do it's a must do it's a mandate rather than if you can or whether you can afford it. So these are, these are the elements of the continuity of care piece of work we've been doing and I'll be talking about that are in the, the planning guidance. Really important in order to get to get our transformational change that we want that is based on the evidence and research that you all provide for us, we have to have the right leadership. So we need resilient leaders who can design from the heart and the head. We need leaders who can be empathetic, but also be clear about what they need to achieve and how they're going to achieve it. We need leaders who will put the mission first. This, uh, these elements, I should have said, elements one to five come from an article that Deloitte's have put together that is specific to managing res or delivering resilient leadership and responding to COVID-19. So you can see here that it's imperative that, that the mission is, is held tightly and put first. So despite how much stabilizing you might have to do when you move through wobbles and well, it's more than a wobble, a tidal, tidal wave of, of COVID-19, you have to stabilize, but you also need to prioritize and ensure that you don't lose sight of what the mission is. Speed over elegance, really important that decisive action is delivered with courage. Expediency is necessary when we're looking at things that we want to put in place to save mothers and babies' lives. Seize the narrative at the outset, own the narrative. Acknowledge what we don't know, that's a really important point here. Um, but paint a compelling picture of the future that will inspire all of the wider team around us and our people in the NHS to persevere. Stay focused on the horizon and spark innovations that will define tomorrow. And I think those last two points, particularly points four and five, has been demonstrated by Professor Sarah Gilbert, who's leading the research um, in Oxford um, to find a vaccine to COVID-19. So the examples that I'm going to talk you through from NHS England are continuity of carer, the delivery of continuity of carer, a national campaign to deliver continuity of carer to women and their families, and the Saving Babies Lives Care Bundle about reducing significant, redu seeing re re significant reduction in the rates of maternal and neonatal mortality. So continuity of carer. This is an example, I'm going to go through the points that I made earlier. This is an example of how an infographic has been used to really catch the attention, capture the attention of, um, of our services, of our people, of our women and their families um, in order to be able to push for uh, um, a complete change in the model of how we deliver our services. So it's really important that we have eye grabbing sort of um, mind grabbing headlines and research that's translated into bite sized chunks. So it's 19% less likely to lose your your life, 19% less likely to lose your baby before 24 weeks. If you have a model of midwife led continuity of carer, that is a bite sized chunk that's nice and easy to 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 have a dialogue and to narrate to women and, and their families and to services and to finance directors, etc. This is really important. 
success factors. This is just to demonstrate to you the success factors that we, that we have been able to see in, with the implementation of continuity of carer in, in England. So it has been important to make sure that we define, define what we're going for correctly. We need to make sure we've got the right numbers in place, sufficient numbers of midwives to birth ratios. So we need to define what we want to do well, and we need to deliver it well. A clear implementation plan commitment. So that strength of commitment at the board or at the trust level, um, at government level, as I was saying earlier, the drivers, uh, the, um, the system drivers to push a trust board or a trust, um, a, a board or a trust level to really open their eyes and grab and grab their attention. Policy and finance, we have to, you have to address that, make sure we've got government level of commitment and we have had that through the Better Births Review and the long term plan. Resourcing, willingness to change, you really need to work with the people and co-design what we're trying to do so to make sure that you win hearts and minds as you work along the pathway of change. A strong core team is really important in order to deliver this particular aspect of continuity of carer, ongoing evaluation and feedback, and a really um, supportive management approach. That is so important when we're, when we're implementing large scale change. Partnership working imperative between managers, union, professional representation. Make sure, as I said earlier, that we're bringing our people with us. Proximate leadership, this is also something about, you know, we're only going to really see large scale change if our leaders help to drive that by becoming proximate with the midwives, with the doers, with the people who are on the front line delivering the change. And this is a slide, a picture of Professor Jackie Dunkley Burns on one of her visits that she went out to 26 visits in order to talk about the importance of delivering continuity of carer. 26 visits by our Chief Midwifery Officer out there to talking the talk and explaining and getting close to her, her, the midwives and clinicians who are delivering this change. We need to demonstrate effectiveness, as I, as I said earlier, this is a, an example of that. So one of our local maternity systems, our LMS, has demonstrated, has shown early findings indicating that when with the delivery of continuity of carer, women are more likely to give birth at home and have a lower rate of elective cesarean births. So this is a real clear, clear example of how ongoing research and evidence can motivate the, the people that we're working with to say, this is the right thing to do. Keep going. We're doing well. We can't stop. We can't. We've got to keep our goal in mind. And we found along the way further research. This is so important that we have ongoing research to demonstrate that actually, so we're doing okay. But we have, we now know that um, that outcomes are worse for our black black Asian women, um, minority ethnicities, women from the poorest parts of our our, our geography. They have the poorest health outcomes. So we really need to re, um, be ready to target those particular groups from 20, our ambition is, is from 2021 and beyond, but actually it's happened now. We have a moral imperative to act now and that's what we're doing. So just to talk briefly about the Saving Babies Lives Care Bundle, similarly, this, was, this has been written into the long term, the NHS long term plan. It's, uh, we have a driver for it. We have it in policy. We have our very own Secretary of State pushing for a reduction in, um, in, in maternal and neonatal mortality and fetal mortality. So we have the drivers there, we have the evidence there to say we have to do it. And now we're working working towards implementing this. We, we are implementing and we have implemented the Saving Babies Lives Care Bundle in order to address this issue. And there are five areas of the Saving Babies Lives Care Bundle, reducing reduction in smoking, risk assessment and surveillance of pregnancy and, and fetal growth restriction, 
raising awareness of the reduction of fetal movements, effective monitoring in labour, making sure staff are competent in this area, and reducing preterm birth. So you can see here that we're doing quite well. However, stillbirth rates still remain high in some areas. As I've just noted, the, our black, black population, Asian babies, those most deprived, these, these are still what they not are they are they are not what we want to see. The UK rate is 3.74%. So why is it higher in groups of black, Asian and minority ethnicity? Why is it higher? That's a question that we need to have answered by our research scientists and our groups of scientists that are working working away. So, so within this, we need those questions to be asked and our research scientists to help us to, to get a complete picture. We are approaching our work within the NHS in our maternity work as a life course approach. Um, we, we know that this is what's required to meet the ambitions that we have. We need to look at how do we get better outcomes through pregnancy, um, through the antenatal pathway, within our intrapartum pathway and also postnatally, how do we improve our outcomes along the whole life course um, that we see in front of us here. And this is again where we need to work on specific areas um, where there is higher risk with our researchers so that we can understand where we need to put our resources. So what are we achieving? This just demonstrates that by working with our research community, by working um, with ensuring that we um, target our resources at those most needy areas, we are seeing improvements, but there is so much more to do. So implementation of change that relates to the research that has been done in the midst of global crisis. Well, it's really tricky. It's really tricky. It's disheartening because we find ourselves moving towards a certain target and then this huge, the, the rug is pulled out from under our feet. However, we have to manage the barriers that come our way and we have to do it in a way that takes our people with us. So we are needing to balance the, um, the desire within us to improve care for women and babies with the workforce that we have who are weary, who are battered, who are suffering from um, anxieties because of COVID-19. So that's where we're at now. We're having to we're having to provide leadership that brings our people with us. Um, and what we're finding is that there are pockets across England of groups and maternity services and clinicians who are re reinstigating the teams that are providing continuity of carer, that personalised care for women and their families, despite the um, barriers that have come their way. So that's good to see. And we are envisaging that moving forward, we will be able to get into restoration, that we will be able to work with our teams to really get back on track with the ambitions that we have. And of course, in the midst of any crises, we see opportunities emerging. And this is what we look to our research community to help us to really grasp hold of opportunities that come our way so that we can work effectively, efficiently, making a difference where it really, really matters. So it's really important that we have cutting edge research which will drive the future to improve the care that we give to our women and, and their families, to drive down stillbirth rates, neonatal mortality and, um, and maternal mortality, to ensure that we are always striving for, for the very best we can for the health of our people, of our nation and of our futures.
So now I'd just like to say a very big thank you to all of you uh, for listening this morning, for working with us, for helping us to get as far as we have got in terms of delivering on our ambitions for maternity services in England. And this is a picture of some wonderful midwives in England and we all want to thank you on behalf of our mothers and babies and we look forward to working with you in the future. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we have a question in the chat. But before we address that, um, I, I just wanted to say that um, in the NHS in England, we do have as much as possible policy based on evidence. We have nice guidelines, we have systematic reviews that inform that. But where I sense the gap is, and it is relevant for this audience, is in how you implement that evidence. Quite a lot of it comes from trials, but then implementing that in the real messy world we do seem to have less research evidence and from your point of view what could this audience give you that would help you with the practicalities of rolling out your ambition thank you jane um yes that's a really good question um and i think one of the first things is to work um work in co-design <laughs> with our researchers at the very outset. So that's the very first thing I think. Let's make sure, as I said in the talk, that we get the question right at the outset, that the researchers are sort of scratching an itch, you know, that we have as policy leads. So an example would be at the moment, um, the concerns we've all got across the, across globally about uh, um, the higher incidence of BAME women and, and their families uh, are affected by COVID-19. Um, and, um, and, and we need that, we need some answers to all of that, that big question. So the first thing would be, yeah, absolutely co-design so that, um, so that we have a vetted interest in what, so we're, we're there at the beginning of the journey, I guess, Jane, um, and colleagues on the call. We're there at the beginning of the journey with you. So we're almost looking out for, and we can't wait to hear the outcome of the research so that we can, we can at that point start to think about how we're going to implement. So I think that's really important that we're involved at the very outset and that we're involved in the co-design of the, of what's being done. Mm. And, and to me, that's really interesting because we pay a lot of attention to co-design with service users. Our notion of talking to policy makers, particularly at the top, about co-design, I think is quite novel and also very exciting to have the opportunity to do that. So we have a question from John Ofrevite. Um, Churchill, do you want to turn John's mic on so he can ask himself? Um, yes, please, I will. Um, just to look for him now. One second, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, can you hear me all right? Yes. I, yes. Don't, I don't know. You really need me to read this out. I don't know if you can see the question. It's yes. um, it basically it's three. Um, as regards uh, visits for antenatal care. Do you um, are you well geared up for telemedicine to invite and chase people? And I'm interested in how how you do that and how you implement it. Secondly, on ethnic differences in utilisation of uh, ANC in the UK or maybe just uh, England over the last months, because we've seen a big drop. Um, in that we've had to chase people here in Stockholm. And any thoughts also about um, implementation issue, how, how, to, how to enable or, or speed, use implementation science to improve take up of ANC and vaccination in the next uh, few months. We've, we've recently had a big drive initiative on vaccination take up 
um, and we've had to use a number of communication and other. It, indeed, indeed, volunteers simply going round some of the apartment blocks and um, putting up posters and things and, and talking to faith-based leaders and others. I, I'm, I'm curious how, how, what methods and approaches you're using to implement both of those necessary uh, things. Thank you. Thank you, John. That's really, really in interesting. We're obviously going on a similar journey as you, as you all are in Sweden. So um, let's go with the first one. Um, yes, we have been doing virtual visits, antenatal clinic visits in the UK. Um, we were successful in bidding to be able to purchase um, a large number of home home-based uh, blood pressure monitors, for example, and this was, um, this was given out geographically, regionally to, the, to women who could then monitor their own blood pressures out there in their homes, obviously with clear instructions. So that's one of the things that we have done alongside the virtual antenatal clinic visit. So I think we're, we're doing, in that sense, we're doing similar to, to, to you guys. Um, Data on ethnic differences in utilisation. We don't have any data, I'm afraid, not as far as I am aware at the moment. But what we do know is that, as, as you know too, is that um, the impact of COVID has been great, far greater on, on those in impoverished um, geographical areas and also um, our Black, Asian, minority ethnic ethnicities. Um, so we are doing some work to particularly target those groups um, through across the NHS. There are there are four steps to our plan. Um, and the first one is about increasing support within our geographical regions and across our local maternity systems, increasing support specifically um, for those system leaders to be able to provide um, bespoke uh, communications and all that sort of thing out to these particularly vulnerable communities. So it's about raising awareness in the regions, giving support to local systems when, as they are developing their own plans as to how they're going to um, make, a, make a difference to this. Uh, the second one is about communications. And you already spoke about, John, uh, faith leaders and communities. And, and in all of our different regions in England, I mean, they're so different, so varied, as yours would be too. Um, and so it's really important to engage with the local faith leaders and those who, who can influence our communities um, of these groups. So communications is the second one. The third one is about vitamin D. So it's increasing awareness of the need for our um, uh, minority ethnicities, black and Asian women and populations to be taking vitamin D. And the fourth one is to be, be specific about gathering ethnicity data. So there we go. That's, and we need the data that you've asked for, whether we have in your question number two. So um, I hope that answers your question, John. Yeah, uh, I'm going to move on to Teana. Um, Tayana, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I wonder what is it about a um, continuity of care model? What is the underlying mechanism that leads to improved um, outcomes? Well, do you know, Tayana, you are very fortunate because you've got the, um, the very amazing Professor Jane Sandel on this call who actually led, the, <laughs> led the, the, the Cochrane study in looking at continuity of care. Yeah. So I'm going to delegate the answer of that question to Jane. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Jess. Um, Tayana, yeah, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? And we have been doing some really interesting using realist research and realist approaches to try and understand what the mechanism is. Um, some of the program theories we've had around increasing trust um, of women in the profession and the health system, reducing stress, uh, ability to access care better, and for women who have concerns to have a faster response. So we've been testing that in several 
stud is and it'll be good to catch up with you sort of another time tale to go through go through uh, it's uh, there's a lot of teams all over the world that are really curious about this issue thank you thank you very much uh, we have a question from Nick. Um, do you want to ask a question? Uh, sure. Thank you, uh, uh, Jane. So Jessica, it's a lovely, uh, a lovely talk, really. And um, uh, the way I've just tweeted about it, that you, you're effectively in a lot of your slides, you, you're throwing quite significant challenges, if you like, to implementation sciences in terms of, you know, what designs, frameworks, measures, and, uh, and other techniques we, we have which we can use to try and support you know, national implementation of this, this um, sort of evidence base. So I wonder if um, um, yourself or NHS England or uh, Royal Colleges and so on would have a sort of a short list of well-evidenced interventions that we really need to be putting into practice and whether these are the ones that we should be directing implementation studies at rather than sort of you know, keep producing. It's great to produce novel clinical evidence, but the audience particularly in this conference is, is sort of looking for what are the sort of high you know value priority tickets uh, really to design you know implementation trials rather than clinical trials to figure out how best to um, um to 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 implement so if this is something that um, i think this audience might really need to hear um, um if you've got some ideas to how this could be um done and where we should be focusing yeah, I think I think that's a fantastic idea, uh, Nick. I really like that, and I can see James' face <laughs> equally as as enamoured by what you've just said. So, um, yes, I mean, what's what's fantastic about the new structure we've got in England with our chief midwifery officer is that we are going to put some resource into research. We're going to have a head of midwifery research post, and we're really keen that we can support and. Um, and promote you know this the this sort of practices that you've described in in a much more um a much more helpful way into our our scientific scientific communities so i think if it's okay nick jane and i would like to no doubt take this away um and have a think about how we can support um what you've mm -hmm. suggested because i think it's really important the other thing i've really noticed with um with ourselves when we've been implementing change is the importance of behavioral scientists it's so it's going to be crucial especially when we're looking at this issue of you know how do we make sure that the most most vulnerable groups of our populations are uh, can access the um the implement the changes that we want to make um what, what is it that will speak to them and that will make the changes that we need to see particularly in 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 our um black um asian and minority ethnicities and also in our most vulnerable populations um, because, you know, we, we know for a fact from there's some recent uh, evidence from Doctors of the World have done, a, done a, a research study around the most excluded groups and they have found that whilst, whilst um, folk that live in poverty, they, they may have mobile phones, etc. They, they, what they won't have is any, you know, any money in them. They won't have any account or there won't, they won't be any option to use them. So, so I guess it's really important that we, we look at those things too. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to add a comment. Yes, and I think it's really important that there is a recognition that there is evidence based about how we implement things, as well as evidence based about the intervention itself. So I think, Nick, you're absolutely right. Uh, there is evidence out there. Uh, and you know the challenge is to us to put that together and then work with policy makers like Jess to test those out. Um, one, one question from Chloe. Uh, Chloe, do you want to ask your question? Or shall I ask it? Can you see it? Yes. yes, I can see it there. Yeah. Yeah. Chloe, 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 yeah. Go on, Jane. Um, so she said, um, have you, you have you used implementation of the science to improve telehealth adoption and acceptability? Okay, great question. To be honest. Oh, here she is. Oh. 
Hi, I was able to unmute. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm like joining this from New York and we've been implementing telehealth um, across one of the biggest hospitals, Mount Sinai. And I was just interested to see like how you guys in NHS have um, been overcoming the barriers to adoption with telehealth. <laughs> Okay, well, we're <laughs> to be. I'll be absolutely honest with you, Chloe. Um, uh, when when COVID hit, it was a case of doing everything that we could do. We, it's the whole thing about working in, at speed with elegance and not not having all the answers. So, if I'm honest, um, we had to move to virtual um, telehealth, as you call them, um, clinics, uh, setups, um, because that was the only way that we were going to be able to deliver. Uh, midwifery care. Um, I'm not sure, we, we weren't particularly, um, uh, I, I'm not aware of actually whether we used implementation science to be honest with you it, as we were as we were spreading this out. I'm sure Jane might be able to help me out here um, but it was more a case of this this is the, uh, the only way we're going to be able to reach our women and our population so we had to use it. And it will be something, um, to be honest, that we will be probably keeping because for some women it's, it's, it's served a greater purpose than, you know, having to go, um, having to take trips and journeys and travel, etc. to have their appointments. So it's something that's probably going to stay as a result of, as an option anyway, as a result of, um, of COVID. I might add that um, one of the challenges is knowing what to keep um, and what to bring back and what to implement um, and there are there is some work at the moment gathering women and the staff use on telehealth. Thank you very much, Jess. Um, thank you very much, Jane.